Okay, good evening everybody. So we begin with a new lesson, with a new chapter uh, for this week and the concluding chapter in our introductory uh, course in economics. It deals with international trade. Your book. Uh, I also posted another article for you to read in files, so please take a look at that article as well. It covers some of the same ground as textbook, but adds some additional details that you might find interesting for this particular problem. So international trade, there are a couple of things that, that we will uh, cover here. The economics of international trade, what are theoretical justifications for free international trade, what are the arguments and counter arguments for free international trade versus protectionism, and what are the um, economic effects of many of the policies that are used to curb or limit free international trade. So we'll start first with one difference that exists very often. It is very remarkable. The difference between how public in general looks at free trade and globalization and economic internationalism versus how economists look at it in the same problem. So we can say that economists, there is one saying very often invoked, invoked that if you have two economists, you will have three opinions about any given issue. And that's true as far as it goes, but it doesn't go far enough as to cover free trade. So this is one of the areas in which this famous saying about notoriously uh, diverse uh, in their opinions economists doesn't apply. That economists are remarkably unison in their uh, defense of free trade and in their denunciations of protectionist policies and protectionist arguments for protectionist policies. So we will see in this lecture some of the reasons why economists believe in free trade what economic and theoretical arguments connect free trade to some more basic economic principles from which they follow. So that's the basic reason why economists believe in free trade, not because they, they are ideologically inclined to believe in free trade or because they're, they like the foreigners or anything like that, but because the free trade dogma or the free trade principle follows from some more general principles of economics that are universally accepted. If you have uh, some principle that is axiomatically true, that is universally accepted, and if you derive logically a consequence or application of this principle, then you are forced to believe that this consequence or application will be true as well. So I'll try and explain you in, in greater detail later on what are these basic cornerstone economic principles that economists consider self-evident, almost true, accepted, and why from these principles it follows almost axiomatically or automatically that the free trade should be considered or accepted. So for now, just bear in mind that there is a, this wide gap or wide divide between the general public on the one hand, and by general public I also include people, non-economists of all stripes. So not only uneducated people, but many people who are educated in other disciplines but do not study economics uh, at any depth, they're much more likely to distrust free trade and to support protectionism than economists. 
one basic preliminary uh, motif or one basic preliminary principle that we encountered already that I warned you about from the very beginning that all bad economic ideas or almost all bad economic ideas have one thing in common and that is that, the, that they all almost without exception concentrate on the short-term gains from certain economic policies short-term gains for isolated groups while ignoring the long-term systematic effects on a large scale for all groups in society. So this was true when we studied uh, the fiscal stimulus and when we study minimum wages and we study a variety of phenomena, we see that people very often believe, believe problematic things, believe things that are not true economically because they look reasonable, they look commonsensical, they look plausible. If we limit ourselves to the short-term visible observable effects for some groups, while ignoring the long-term invisible, indirect, postponed, delayed effects to the entire society and to all groups in society. So something similar applies to protectionism. Protectionism more or less people study how economic system works and less people study in detail how tariffs and other forms of international protectionism in, in trade work, more likely they are to support these measures. Because these measures create all you always have to to bear in mind that all economic policies, all government interventions in the economic life create winners and losers. So they always redistribute income from somebody to somebody else. So then theoretically any government policy that harms one group and benefits another group could be defended by pointing to the beneficiaries or the winners of that particular policy. And one of the most pernicious effects of most harmful government interventions is that for us, for an objective observer who is not well informed or interested in studying more deeply the problem, it's always much more easier, it's always much easier to identify the beneficiaries and winners rather than losers of government interventions. So, for, for example, when you look at minimum wages, some people will get employment and they will get higher wages as a consequence of this, but the losers will be people who are not visible, who are not going to, to get a job in the future. And so, on. so there is this as, uh, information asymmetry between the winners whom you can see, whom you can interview for the television, whom you can talk with, about their situation, and on the other hand, silent majority of people who are going to be hurt in the long run, whom you cannot interview, who are not visible, and so on. So in foreign trade, the same thing applies. Who are beneficiaries, even without entering more deeply into the details of analysis, technical analysis of uh, tariffs and quotas and whatnot, we can identify the beneficiaries of protectionism, foreign trade protectionism. Those would be domestic firms that are protected from foreign competition. So you can see them, you can identify them, you can see their workers getting better wages, at least in the short term, avoiding unemployment and so on. So the beneficiaries and winners are visible. Who are the losers? The losers are consumers, customers, and many other industries in the economy. But these losses are incremental smaller, postponed, delayed, they're not so easily visible and identifiable. So there is this bias, informational bias for people to support government interventions because the beneficiaries of government interventions are visible and they're concentrated. So these two principles are very important. That concentrated benefits, which means a relatively small group of people deriving great deriving large benefits from government interventions. For example, steel companies, like a few big corporations and their employees are main beneficiaries. And then the government says, look, 
we protected these firms. Look how, how well they are doing. Whereas the catch-22 is that everybody is losing, everybody else is losing. Higher prices of steel, uh, the, the uh, smaller quantity of steel is being imported, that industries that, uh, that produce steel are overemployed, less employment for other, uh, less employment and capital for other industries. So all of these losses are long term and spread over a great number of other people, majority in society. So they are not visible immediately and they are small. They are relatively difficult to observe empirically. So these facts then lead to the political dynamics or political economy of uh, foreign trade protectionism that is that it's politically it's much easier to support protectionism be, uh, than free trade and there are two reasons for this the first reason is that for 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 a normal objective person even 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 handed person it looks reasonable it's it looks plausible that the tariffs will protect domestic industries because of the reasons i told you this information asymmetry <coughs> and the second reason is nationalism it's always easier to appeal to nationalist sentiments versus foreigners who are doing us harm or who are enemies or whoever Chinese Russians or Europeans doesn't matter at all it's always politically more palatable to to push a nationalist platform rather than some kind of globalist international uh, ideology of common good of the entire humanity. So for a politician, for both of these reasons, protectionism is a, is a tempting idea. Okay, so, so much about political economy of protectionism, why protectionism is, why resistance to free trade is something that is popular and common and widespread among general public and among politicians. Now, I promised you at the very beginning that the reason why economists beg to disagree with protectionist sentiments is that they believe that there are certain theoretical reasons from which or certain theoretical principles from which uh, the, the beneficial character of free trade follows almost directly. So certain theoretical principles that have nothing to do with foreign trade and foreigners and protectionism and domestic industries at all, certain more general, more elementary theoretical principles from which then it follows directly when you apply them to international trade it looks like you have no choice but to support free trade so now i'm going to identify these two principles for you we already talked about them thus far so these two principles are division of labor and the principle of comparative advantage so division of labor and comparative advantage why first why this what these two principle principles mean and why from these two principles it follows that international trade should be accepted so what is the division of labor division of labor is a phenomenon that people specializing that it relates to the phenomenon of specialization that productivity of an economy is always going to be greater if different people specialize in what they are most productive in or better at doing and they, they create produce as much as possible and then they exchange with other people the surpluses of whatever they produce so you don't typically produce everything that you consume in an advanced economy nobody produces everything they consume they typically produce one or two things at the most specialize in producing that one thing and then they draw income from that and they use their income then to uh, to buy other things produced by other people so that's the basic common sense principle of modern economy without specialization without division of labor we wouldn't wouldn't have been able to produce almost anything so even the most primitive forms of economic 
organizations have a certain amount of division of labor. The degree of division of labor and specialization in a modern economy is simply like a mind boggling, mind bending. So it's obvious, I, I hope that I should not try further to convince you that without division of labor, we cannot have a modern developed economy. Division of labor is a phenomenon based uh, uh, following from the uh, principle that specialization is productive. Specialized production is more productive than non-specialized production. Okay. Now, what is the principle according to which we decide who is going to produce what? So, okay, it's good that you have doctors and engineers and professors and computer engineers and farmers. The different people and different groups of people would be doing different things. We'll be specializing in different things. But now the, the question is, what is the principle according to which they and society as a whole decide who is going to do what? So this principle of specialization of division of labor is something called comparative advantage. So what is comparative advantage? Comparative advantage is a term that refers to who is better or more productive in doing something than somebody else. So if you have a comparative advantage in, in farming, then you should specialize in farming. Now, the, as for the content of comparative advantage, we should distinguish we should distinguish it from, from the so-called absolute advantage. So absolute advantage is simply means that I am more productive than you as a farmer. I can produce more corn than you. Then I should specialize in producing corn and you should specialize in something else because you are inferior to me. You cannot produce as much of corn or wheat as I can do. So comparative advantage is not that. <clears throat> comparative advantage does not refer to differences in absolute advantage. Comparative ad uh, advantage refers to the ability to do the same job, to do the same work by employing, by using fewer resources. Or, which is the same thing, at a lower opportunity cost. So comparative advantage is a principle of specialization in division of labor, and whoever can do something at lower opportunity cost than somebody else has a comp comparative advantage over that person in performing that task. My favorite example that I probably already bored you with a couple of times thus far is a, is a nice illustration of this. So imagine now as an illustration of, of uh, comparative advantage, Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon.com, it's a very a company that is doing very well in this quarantine situation we are faced, we are finding ourselves in right now. Imagine now that Jeff Bezos needs another janitor for his head, headquarters. And imagine that Jeff Bezos has five applicants for the job and he discovers that even the best one among them is two times less efficient than he himself, Jeff Bezos. So now the question is, should Jeff Bezos, who should be doing the janitor's work at Amazon headquarters. Jeff Bezos, who is two times more efficient, or janitor, who is two times less efficient. So if you look absolute advantage, Jeff, Jeff Bezos has an absolute advantage. He's two times better than this guy. But now the problem that economic organization, this system of economic organization has to face is not who should be doing the job of a janitor, but how the productivity of the Amazon corporation could be increased in the long run. So yes, Jeff Bezos has a two times advantage in, in doing the janitor's work, but he has probably 200 times or 2,000 times or, or 200,000 times uh, advantage in doing the job of the CEO. So what does that mean? That means then that the janitor, although at an absolute disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis Jeff Bezos, has a comparative advantage in doing the janitor's job. Why? 
because the opportunity cost, opportunity cost is the value lost while you're doing something. Opportunity cost of Jeff Bezos doing the janitor's work is on order on orders of magnitude higher than the opportunity cost of janitor's job. So ask yourself for a moment, what society as a whole loses if, if the janitor works as a janitor at Amazon? It loses something else that the same guy could, could have done, which is probably less valuable to society than, he, than the janitor's job at Amazon because the guy probably wouldn't have applied for the job if he had something better to do. On the other hand, the opportunity cost, the value lost if Jeff Bezos were to do the job would be his work as a, as a CEO that produces an orders of magnitude higher economic value to society. So for, from a standpoint of creating value economic value in society, although Jeff Bezos has an absolute advantage and he's better in doing janitor's work, he shouldn't be doing it, he should be employing somebody less productive than himself to do the job. So see, then this principle of a comparative advantage is sometimes called the Ricardo's Law of Association. David Ricardo is a British economist who discovered the principle. Why the Law of Association? Because the the principle allows people with different levels of productivity to associate together and cooperate irrespective of the fact that, that, they, are, that they have different productivities. So we, very often, we are very often thought that competition and economic, uh, uh, economic logic of capitalism is a competition and exploitation of the weak by the strong. Whereas in reality, it's the other way around. The, the, the system of, of profit seeking is something that allows Jeff Bezos' of this world to profit from janitors' cooperation and also the janitors of this world, less productive, poorer people, to benefit from mutually beneficial cooperation with wealthy people. So no matter how low your productivity is, you can find some place in the economic system of division of labor because nobody can do everything that they need done. Even Jeff Bezos, if nothing else, he has the limitation of how long he can work. He cannot work 25 hours per day. So he needs cooperation of a janitor as well as janitor needs cooperation of his employer. So this is law of association based on comparative advantage that allows division of labor to proceed and to spread. So now, how is this principle, so how are these two principles, division of labor and comparative advantage applied to international trade? It's very simple. So just substitute America for Jeff Bezos and China for the janitor. So theoretically, American economy and American workers can produce anything. We can assume that for a moment, even if we assume it. It's not quite clear, but let's simplify that. Americans can produce everything better than Chinese, better product. That they're more productive and better workers and, and work with better machinery. They can produce everything much better than, than the Chinese. Does that mean that America should be producing everything that America consumes? No. The basic reason for that is that Chinese can produce certain things, just like janitor can produce the janitor services at lower opportunity cost. Chinese can produce certain things at lower opportunity cost. So, for example, American workers who would be employed, American engineers, chemical engineers, and so on, who would be working in, in uh, plastic toy producing plants, would have been undervalued because their skills in an American economy, which is very well advanced and based on research and development, could have been exploited much better in producing something else, in research and development of microchips or wherever else uh, American labor force is better at doing. And then Chinese workers and Chinese engineers, although they are less productive in absolute terms than American workers, should be producing plastic toys and cheap uh, electronics and cheap uh, clothes and so on. Not because 
they are better than Americans, but because they can produce it at lower opportunity cost. Other things that they could that could be producing, had they not produced these things, would be of lower value than other things that the American workers could could produce. So just like Jeff Bezos and Janitor, American and Chinese workers can make a division of labor based on their comparative advantage. Americans are in general better in high tech and research and development, and Chinese have comparative advantage in making cheap and relatively less sophisticated stuff. And that they would exchange their services in the same way in which Jeff Bezos and Janitor exchange their services. Jeff Bezos offers the service of employing the janitor, and Janitor offers the his services of swiping floors. So the principle, so international trade at the basic, basic level is just an application of the principle of comparative advantage. So what would have happened if you then decide to, to cut this free trade between China and America? You would be forcing both Chinese and Americans to specialize in and produce stuff in which they don't have, they don't have the uh, comparative advantage. So just if the, the exact same thing as, he, as if you were to forbid or prohibit or significantly, significantly obstruct cooperation, contractual agreements between Bezos and Janitor. Force Jeff Bezos to work three hours per day, to lose three hours of, of, of his labor that he could have devoted to making to making Amazon more, more, more profitable, to swipe floors. So society as a whole would be losing because we are better off with Amazon increases its efficiency and it's the level of its services because we get Amazon services as consumers at lower prices and higher quality. So it's bad for us as a society if Jeff Bezos has to swipe his own floors. It's also bad for him. It, but it's also bad for janitor because janitor applied for the job be, probably because he didn't have any other better opportunity. If you prevent him with whatever government policy to get the job at Amazon, he would get an inferior job, probably less paid. So janitor is worse off. Jeff Bezos is worse off. We as consumers are worse off. So this is something similar applies if you force America to specialize both in making high-tech products and cheap plastic toys, so then part of the labor force of American labor force that could have worked in high-tech and research and development will have to be relocated into the areas in which it is relatively less productive ma making plastic toys, because we need both as a society. We want to buy both. And in China as well, they will have to move if they want to have both high tech products and, and cheap toys, they will have to move part of their labor force that is more productive in making cheap plastic toys into research and development. So both America and China will have an inferior mix of products of both kinds if you prevent them or sufficiently limit their ability to exchange their stuff that they produce. So the idea is that to, to let Americans produce, invest and employ most people in producing what they are relatively better off and Chinese to invest in producing in what they're better off and they exchange their surpluses. If you prevent that, you're going to make both countries worse off. So that's the theoretical basis or theoretical justification of free trade. <clears throat> now, what is protectionism? Protectionism is a policy that does this, that, that cuts the ties or limits the economic ties or limits the ability of Americans and Chinese or Americans and Japanese or any two countries to trade and exchange freely their goods and services and to, uh, prevents them from fully exploiting their relative comparative advantages to the mutual benefit. So there are different, different uh, 
types of different ways in which this could be done. The most obvious and most widely used one is, is a tariff. So tariffs are taxes on import. So you impose a tax on imported goods, 5, 10, 20 percent, and then the foreigners had to pay in addition to uh, their prices have to reflect not only the selling price on the American market, but also this additional cost of paying tax to the, uh, to the American government. So that's one limitation. So these are arbitrary taxes that do not apply to domestic producers, only to foreign producers. Quotas are quantitative limitations on imports. So that means that Japanese can export to America only whatever 500,000 units of automobiles and no more. Or if they more to if they want to export more, they will have to pay higher, much higher tariffs. That's something, by the way, that happened in 1980s, eventually, that President Reagan threatened to impose tariffs, and then the negotiations ensued in which Japanese accepted voluntarily to, uh, to self-impose quotas of how many automobiles they were going to export to America. But there are other, uh, more indirect forms of protectionism that that are not always uh, so visible, and that are content regulations. So domestic um, government would impose the specific requirements that the products have to satisfy, that would be fa artificially favorable to domestic companies and putting foreign, co uh, foreign competitors at a disadvantage. So although they do not directly prevent foreigners or do not directly burden foreigners with, with um, uh, taxes or limitations, they indirectly disadvantage them by, uh, by uh, reducing their ability to compete because of the regulations, what kind of characteristics their products have to have. And these specifications are always favorable to domestic firms, vis-a-vis -vis foreign firms. It's one example of that is uh, one very egregious example of that is the regulations in in the European markets that uh, no um, genetically modified organisms are allowed to be sold in the European Union. So now, what is the the meaning or the purpose of this measure is simply to reduce the or to eliminate the competition of American farmers on the European markets. So American farmers who use genetically modified organisms are cheaper than the European producers. And then the European government, the European Commission imposes these content regulations that no GMO content is allowed. And they don't say we want to, we want to prohibit or to, ha to harm American imports. No, they just impose the uh, content regulations that by a happenstance just accidentally happen to favor European producers and to exclude or harm American producers. So this is how the content regulations work. So you don't specify, you don't say I'm gonna, I want to forbid or prohibit such and such imports. You just sneakily and quietly impose these content regulations that do the job of preventing foreigners without saying it openly. What are the effects of all kinds of economic protectionism? So it doesn't matter from a standpoint of economic effects, all of these measures, all of these approaches have the same effect. So what are the effects? Lower standards of living for domestic population, there's higher prices for domestic population. So you're essentially imposing taxes or impediments to foreigners to compete with domestic producers. So you're going to increase prices. Increased prices mean lower standards of living for domestic population, but also misallocation of resources. And this is more difficult to, to see on the first side, because by favoring certain industries, by uh, 
offering privileges to certain industries, protection to certain industries. You are, in, let, let's say, by imposing tariffs, steel tariffs, you are encouraging further employment and investment in the steel industry. So that means that more machinery, more raw materials, more workers, more money will be moving to steel industry than it would have been the case otherwise. What does that mean? That means because resources are scarce and limited, that less, the fewer resources will be moving to other industries. So we don't need only steel. We need also aluminum and farming, and we need all kinds of other things to produce. We will have, we will have less resources uh, available for these industries. So their prices will increase. They will become more scarce because you artificially, artificially um, encourage, artificially incentivize investment and employment in this one industry. And also high prices of steel, for example, then will affect affect many other industries that will also become artificially more artificially more expensive. Everyone who is using steel will then have to charge higher prices for their products because the one of the input components, one of the key input components, uh, increased in price. So that's misallocation of resources. So instead of having more employees in the aluminum industry, you actually artificially overcrowd the steel industry and produce too much steel as compared to, to an optimum situation to satisfy the, all the consumer needs in the same time. So you see the economy is not just about maximizing one line of production, the economy is about, about finding an optimal mix, an optimal mix of all uh, industries, of production in all industries to satisfy as many of the most urgent consumer needs in the same time. So this tariff and other forms of protection disturb this equilibrium and shift some of the resources that are needed more in other lines of production to this uh, protected industries. Okay, so let's take a look more in detail how, how this works. So this graph shows you the mechanics of economic protectionism, economic effects of tariffs, for example. So let's assume that the protectionist measure is a tariff. So on the vertical axis, you have a price. Let's say the price of steel. We are talking about steel. On the vertical axis is the price. On the horizontal axis is quantity of steel that will be produced. The blue and red lines are domestic supply curve and domestic, <coughs> domestic demand curve for steel. So what does that mean? That means depending on the price on the horizontal axis, the quantity of steel will increase. If price is very low, only the most efficient firms will be producing steel. If, if the price for whatever reason increases, the quantity of domestic steel will increase as well. And also demand, you see, if the price is higher, less steel will be bought. If the price goes down, more steel will be bought. So, if there is no import of steel at all, so what would be the equilibrium price and equilibrium quantity of steel produced only on the domestic market? So, that would be the intersection of the red and blue curves, domestic supply curve and domestic demand curve. So, this would be the price, like the, <coughs> this projection on the, on the, I axis here on the price axis that would be the domestic price and domestic quantity will be the horizontal projection on the horizontal axis here this much steel will be produced and this price in the absence of any foreign foreign steel on the American market in the absence of any imports so now let's assume that the, so, so that's the first Step. The second step, let's assume that there is a free trade in steel, that there are no limitations whatsoever of the ability of people to import steel. So zero tariffs. So what's going to happen then? What will be the price at which everybody will be selling in the American market then? That would be the world price. So now the American price, if America is isolated economy, would be determined by domestic supply and demand. However, the world price of steel is, de is determined by the world supply and demand for steel. 
And since America is just one country among many other countries, if we assume that American production is like a 5% of the world production of steel, then whatever happens in America cannot influence the world price. The world price is given. America has to take the world price of steel as it is. Nothing America does in producing steel can substantially affect the world price. Okay, so the world price is down here, and it is given. Imagine that there is a free trade in, in, in steel, and this is the price that exists. The world market determines by its supply and demand the price, and everybody, America, Russia, Brazil, China, Lux, Luxembourg, everybody has to buy and sell steel at this world price down here. Okay, but the domestic demand and supply are still what they are. Demand is what it is, and supply is what it is, because the productivity of American companies is what it is. Okay, what will be the equilibrium level of um, demand in the American economy if there is a free trade? So, the price will be here. Demand and supply curve, domestic demand and supply curve would be wherever they are. The same demands, the demand and supply curves. So then the American industry would be producing this quantity, one, intersection of the world price curve and domestic supply curve. This would be the quantity that American industry, steel industry, would be producing at world prices. It cannot afford to produce more because the price is too low. If, if the American market is closed, then many more companies will be producing. You see, the quantity will be over here and the price would be higher. But now the price is lower because of foreign competition, so American domestic firms can afford to produce only this much. What is demand? Demand is the same. Quantity demanded is this C1, quantity supplied is C2, S2, S1. So see this entire difference here. is imported then. So there's this entire difference between QC1 and QS1 is imported in order to satisfy domestic demand. So at this price, domestic firms could produce only this much, but since domestic, domestic buyers want to buy that much, the rest of the, the, rest of the demand is satisfied by imports. Okay, so this entire part, which is 80 90% of the demand, is satisfied by imports. Okay, so that's one thing. So you see how uh, the, the lower world price creates a demand for foreign goods, and how this domestic demand is satisfied by a combination of smaller quantity of domestically produced steel and a larger quantity of imported steel. Okay, now, now two concepts that you have to bear in mind. Consumer surplus and producer surplus. So what is consumer surplus? I think that we mentioned this uh, uh, already once. Consumer surplus is a measure of benefit that buyers derive from buying something on the market. So let's say that you, that you want to buy a cup of Coke or a cup of coffee and the price on the market is two dollars. Okay, and you you would be ready to pay three dollars to get the product. So that's the maximum price that you're that you're ready to pay to acquire a unit of a good is three dollars, and the market price is two dollars. So you're gonna pay two dollars, and this three minus two, this difference between your maximum price or reservation price that you are ready to pay, and the actual price that you are forced to pay on the market is called consumer surplus. That's how much you benefit from having a cup of coffee. Otherwise, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have given $2. 
in exchange for a, for, for, for a cup of coffee. So you have to be ready to pay more for it than, than you will pay on the market. Only people who value a cup of coffee more than $2 will be buying a cup of coffee. So here, only people who are ready to pay more than the world price for a ton of steel will be buying steel. So this entire triangle here then, on the, this, on the horizontal side, world price, demand curve, and the vertical axis, this entire large triangle, that this green triangle plus everything else up to this curve here, is the consumer surplus on the market if there is a free trade. So see, only people who are ready to pay more on the demand curve, who are ready to pay more than this world price, let's say $100 per ton, they will be buying. People who, whose maximum buying prices are lower than, than the world price would, wouldn't be buying anything. Okay, if your reservation price is one and a half dollars for a cup of coffee, that's the maximum price that you, that you feel like paying today and the price is two dollars, you are outside of the market. The market price is higher than your maximum price you're willing to buy, so you're not buying the thing. So the same applies to buyers of steel. If they're not ready to pay the world price for steel, they're outside of the market for steel. So this is consumer surplus. This is a measure of how people, how much all consumers benefit from buying steel at this price here. <clears throat> now you have also producer surplus. So what is <coughs> excuse me? The producer surplus is a difference between the minimum selling price that the producer charges and the market price. So as a buyer, you always pay less than the maximum price that you are ready to pay. Otherwise, you don't engage in a transaction. As a seller, you always sell at the price that is higher than the minimum price that allows you to stay in the business, which means to cover your costs. So your costs have to be lower if you're a domestic steel producing firm. Your costs have to be lower than the world price of steel in order for you to profitably sell steel in the American market. So then, this, this very small yellow triangle here, from this line down here, not the entire yellow triangle, just this small yellow tip down here, is a producer surplus of American domestic firms who produce steel. So only the firms who can afford to sell at a lower price than the world price of steel will enter the market, and this is a measure of their benefits. This small triangle over here. So you see, if there is a free trade, there is a large consumer benefit, measure of how consumers, how much consumers benefit from, <coughs> from free trade, and there is a relatively small this yellow triangle, relatively small producer surplus, which is a measure of how much producers benefit, producers profit from free trade. Now, let's analyze for a moment what happens if we impose tariffs. So what is a tariff? A tariff is a tax on foreign imports. Let's go back here, tax on imports. What is the effect of tariffs? intended effect of tariffs is to increase domestic prices of steel and to protect thereby domestic industries to increase domestic production of steel so foreigners now will have to pay the will have to charge the world price of steel in free trade plus tariff that's this increase in price from this point to this p tariff price level so that's a World price plus tariff. So now, as you can see, that the domestic production will increase from S1 to S2. Now, more American firms could afford to produce because the price is higher. 
Now all those firms that were not profitable at a lower price now become profitable. Now the price is this and everybody who can sell below that price is now in the market. And you see now that the producer surplus increases from this small yellow triangle to the large yellow triangle. All American producers that can sell at a lower price than this new higher tariff created price. What happens to the demand though? What happens to the demand? Domestic buyers do not care who, who is producing steel. They only care about the price of steel. So if price is lower, they're going to be buying more steel. If price is higher, they're going to be buying less steel. So then the demand will shrink here. So the demand will be higher and supply of domestic steel will be greater. So then instead of this entire part of the of the quantity demanded being imported, now the quantity that is imported will be just this um, difference between QC2 and Q, uh, QC2 and QS2. Because the demand will shrink to this and supply will shrink to this. So the difference that has to be filled between domestic supply this is a new domestic supply. This is new domestic demand. The difference is lower. It used to be here, this entire Q, QS1 to, to QC1. That was the difference that had to be filled with imports. Now this difference had shrunk. QC2 to QS1, to QS2. So that's the quantity that is imported now. And quantity that is imported times tariff that's the tax revenue this gray rectangle here so now what happened in terms of the distribution of consumer surplus and producer surplus in the meantime you see now consumer surplus is the benefit that the buyers derive. Only buyers who have higher demand than the existing price, who are ready to pay higher price than the existing market price will be buying. So you'll see that the consumer surplus will substantially shrink from this large triangle here to the new smaller consumer surplus green triangle. So you see producer surplus will increase and consumer surplus will shrink. So that's the first effect of economic protectionism, is a redistribution of income from domestic consumers to domestic producers. And that's the most visible effect, that protectionism benefits producers of domestic steel or aluminum or whatever you want to talk about, and harms people who buy and consume imported goods. So that's the first type of effect, is a redistributive effect of protectionism. Hurting consumers, and we know capitalism is a system based on consumer sovereignty. The final goal of the economic system is to produce as cheap goods at, and as high quality goods as possible to consumers. This works against that. Protectionism reduces consumer benefits and in increases the benefits of isolated producers. But there is another effect as well. There is another effect, and, and that effect is called the deadweight loss. So take a look at the consumer surplus in the original situation when you have free trade, this large triangle. Take a look at the new consumer surplus here. What is the difference? Is this trapezoid here? So that's a that's a size of the consumer surplus that is lost. So society as a whole lost this trapezoid economic value. 
Now, how is this loss? Uh, how is this loss distributed? Who got economic value that was lost to consumers? A part of it went. This yellow part went to producers. Tax revenue went to the government. But then there are these two triangles over here and over here. They didn't go to anyone. This is simply the value of consumer surplus that is lost to everybody. This is dead weight loss. That's something that nobody captures. The gains from trade that exist in the free trade situations that will be lost completely to the society as a whole. So you see now, not only that free trade redistributes wealth from consumers to the government and to producers, but it also reduces the size of the total pie. It doesn't redistribute the entirety of consumer gains lost to, uh, after tariffs. Part of the gains is simply lost. Nobody captures the societal loss. These two uh, reddish triangles are called the dead weight loss. That's a loss to society as a consequence of protectionism that nobody captures. So there are two kinds of effects. The first is the redistributive effect. Consumers lose and producers and the government win. You may think whatever you want about that. You may approve or disapprove, but that's undeniable. But the second effect, the dead weight, dead weight loss effect, is that parts of these losses to consumers are lost to everybody. Nobody else captures them. Consu neither consumers nor producers, not the government. Simply the value that is completely just disappeared. So that's very important to bear in mind that both of these effects exist. Not only that foreign trade protectionism is unjust, if you, if you think that it's unjust to harm consumers in order to benefit the government and producers, but it's also economically inefficient because it reduces the total value of societal wealth. Now, the last point here for today is... Uh, Tariffs protect domestic jobs. That's one of the main arguments that is being invoked routinely. Do the tariffs protect domestic jobs? That may be so in the, in the short run, but in the long run, protectionism, uh, protectionism harms even the industries that, that are protected by tariffs. So here, the steel industry, this is what happens in the short run, producer surplus, so they benefit in the short run. But the trick is, the problem is that in the long run, even those industries are going to be hurt. Why is that? Because they have little incentives to innovate. In order to, to, to stay in the business, in order to retain the existing level of productivity and to improve it, to, to be able to compete, you have to innovate and to reduce your costs. If you don't do it, we know that, that very few products are irreplaceable. So everything has a substitution at a given price. Something is more easily substitutable depending on the price. Something else is less substitutable. So that's called the elasticity of demand. How quickly people will find substitution for, for your good. If you increase your price or you keep increasing prices, how quickly people will shift to something else. Now, there is one thing that elasticity of demand, which means the easiness with which people can find substitutes to your product, is always longer in the long run than in the short run. So that means the longer you keep tariffs, you will then make industries less incentivized to innovate and to reduce costs, which will create higher prices for a longer period of time, which will make demand for their products more elastic, which, which will mean, which will make then consumers more likely to search and find the substitutes for that. 
So in the long run, paradoxically, longer you keep the tariffs, more likely that the industry will be destroyed because the consumers will turn their backs to, to that industry. So nothing is irreplaceable. I can give you any number of examples for that. So take aluminum protected by tariffs, that was one of the factors that contributed to the development of the composite materials airplanes. So the new airplanes like Boeing 787, uh, Dreamliner or Airbus 350, they're made almost entirely of the composite, new synthetical composite materials, not of aluminum, that was a traditional material for, traditional material for airplanes. So many examples like that. So the, especially in the modern high-tech in, environment, it becomes easier and easier to find a replacement for, for, any, for any product. So that in the long run, the jobs that might have been saved in the short run by propping up inefficient industries will be lost in the long run because of the inefficiency of that company. It will make substitution more likely. The second reason is that the higher price of steel or anything else would lead to higher prices of cars. It's very simple. Car industry needs steel as a critical component. And if you increase price of steel, then there will be less jobs in the car industry. Since the, the cars will be more expensive, people will be buying less cars because of higher price, lower employment. So then you, you get jobs you get jobs in, uh, in the steel industries, you lose jobs in the car industry. So the first kind of jobs are visible, the second kind of jobs are not visible. And the third reason is actually there is a misallocation of resources. That you are moving employment and investment from the industries that need more capital and labor to industries that are already overcapitalized and with a higher level of employment. And you're reducing the level of employment in aluminum industry, zinc industry, and so on, while increasing it in, in the steel industry. Okay, that's, that's all I've got for today. So send me your questions and comments that you might have. I will post the PowerPoint uh, uh, later today. And on, on Thursday, we will have the final lecture covering the second part of the, of the chapter 11. Bye-bye for now.